hiker in the woods before. Love the props. All righty. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So the, the bad news is that uh, I'm pretty nervous to be up here, and I feel uh, a little bit unqualified to stand up here before you this morning, but the good news is that the subject they asked me to speak on happens to be the one thing that I am a leading expert in, and that is me, my story, right? So um, God willing, we're going we're gonna to share with you the story of my life and what God has done in it, and I just hope that there's something there for each of you to take away. Um, so to give you some context, my, my wife and I um, grew up in, in Garrett County, which is in western Maryland. It's about an hour or so um, east of here, and we actually, so this is a, a baby picture of her and I, and then when I show that picture from, from prom, I try to convince people that white tuxedos were really in then, but I, I'm not sure that they were. But uh, that's a picture of us at senior prom there. We, we both grew up in, in the Oakland area in Deep Creek Lake, and uh, both of us just came from exceptionally good families. I mean, uh, wonderful childhoods, you have everything that you could ask for. I mean, just, just really um, good, God-fearing, church-going families. And, you know, my parents did a great job of making sure that they, they had me in church, that um, they were building that foundation, you know, for, for me uh, growing up. And, you know, it's important, I think, even as a kid, if you're not, if you're not maybe understanding the depth and, and the complexity of everything that you're hearing um, in, in that church setting, it was at least laying the foundation for what I was going to need later. And I'm, I'm super grateful to my parents for that. Um, Sarah and I met in high school, so, you know, the high school sweethearts thing, I guess that applies to us, and then I graduated, and I went to WVU, and Sarah went east to, to Frostburg State University, and we did the, the long-term, or the uh, long-range dating thing for a little while, and then we ultimately settled here in Morgantown, so right now, um, my, my family and I live over off of the Pierpont exit, and these are my kids that you're hearing, <laughs> so enjoy that this morning. Um, we live off of the Pierpont exit, um, and I, I work in, still work in Western Maryland, but we, we live over here, um, and we're settled here with our three kids. And so um, what I, what I want to do this morning is I, I double-checked, and I, they confirmed that they did not ask for an autobiography. They asked for a testimony. So um, we're just going to hit the high points. Uh, I think the difference there is I'm not going to tell you my story. I'm going to tell you God's story and just the way that he's chosen to bless our family and involve me in his story. And so um, the, first, the first thing I would say about my life is, you know, I think men have been dividing history for a long time between B.C. and A.D., and you can almost do the same thing uh, in my life, dividing it between my childhood and adolescent years and my adult life. And that line is right in 2012. 2012 was a huge year for, for me personally. There was just so much going on. And in the spring, I was, I was graduating from college. Um, my, my parents were actually working through a separation, so I, you know, I was working through some of that emotionally. Um, so I, I graduated in the spring, and then I, I was cramming for the CPA exam. Um, I actually sat for all four parts of the CPA exam in just a couple months. So it was just a ton of, of study and, and, um, and committing myself and my time to that. And, uh, and I was also engaged to marry my wife in, in August of that year. So. Um, in, in August, August 11th, we got married, and we're just kind of starting our life together and figuring all this out, and I was also beginning my, my working career, and so I was commuting from, from here in Morgantown over to, to Western Maryland to work, and uh, then there was one fateful morning in September, it was just a few weeks after we got married, maybe three weeks after we got married, that is kind of the first big formative experience that I want to share with you this morning. Um, I, was, I was commuting to work, and if you're familiar with Garrett County, it's a really rural area. It's a lot more rural than it is, than it is here. Um, and so I'm just, I'm, I'm taking the exit uh, to, to my office, to the, the Grantsville exit. If you've traveled 68, you're maybe familiar with it. Um, and so I'm, I'm taking this exit, and there's, a, uh, there's an unmarked white van with an attached trailer that is uh, kind of in the way. It's, it's sitting basically in the exit, and uh, it had it looked to me like the van and the trailer had kind of jackknifed, you know, drifted backwards and, and was in, in the road. And so my mind immediately goes to the most common thing that you see when you're driving on the road and there's vehicles and things. I'm thinking that there's some construction happening here. And so I, I'm waiting for some instruction about, from somebody about what to do because there's no signs, there's nobody, you know, flaggers or anything like that. And I see this gentleman up in front of me, and he's waving me through. Hey, come on, come on, come on, come through. And so I started to proceed out to the right and go around this van. And uh, 
out of nowhere, this other guy comes running to the, to the left side of my vehicle, and he's flagging me down. Hey, stop, stop, stop. And, and so, you know, the only thing, again, in my mind, this is all happening within just a few seconds, and I'm still in that road construction mentality. And uh, this guy comes up to the left side of my car, and he comes up to the window, and he wants to speak with me. So I started to lo lower my window, roll my window down, and as that window's coming down, all of a sudden the situation changes pretty quickly. And uh, the, there's a fist comes through the, the driver's side window and hits me hard in the, in the left side of my face. And so all at once I'm putting together, this is not a construction crew. This is not what I thought it was. Um, and I, I come to find out that actually what's happening here is there's a, there's a prison work crew that is um, cutting grass. So we've, I think we've probably all seen that happening. And uh, it turns out that this guy was an inmate who had uh, managed to escape from his crew. Uh, and right before I rolled up, he had just finished uh, kind of dispatching his correctional officer. What had happened was this guy had gotten a hold of a pair of needle nose pliers. Um, if you're familiar with needle nose pliers, I don't have a picture of needle nose pliers, but that would have been a good prop um, with, the, with the long, you know, uh, end on the on the pliers and he had actually attacked his correctional officer and stabbed him multiple times in the in the chest and torso and uh, attempting to kill that man and had basically disabled him and then was looking for a way out was looking for a vehicle and so ha who, who happened to be the vehicle that <laughs> rolled up um, and so I didn't realize at the time but what had happened when he came through the window like that all I knew was that he hit really hard and and what happened was he didn't actually hit me with his fist he had he had stabbed me with those pliers um, and it landed right right here in the kind of the temporal area and so I'm kind of trying to get my bearings and he's recoiling for another one and I'm like whoa, whoa, whoa what, what what do you what do you want what do you you know he's get out of the car get out of the car and so he proceeds to pull me from the car I didn't realize at the time but he, he stabbed me again in the back as he's pulling me out and he drives off with my vehicle <laughs> and he actually led the police on a on a pretty extended high-speed chase through the rural back back country roads of uh, of Garrett County and ultimately totaled my car and got arrested and the whole thing but um, you know, they, they took me to the hospital, and I, I was learning as this was all unfolding that the officer was in really bad shape. They're bringing me into the ER. He and I both hit the emergency room at about the same time, and they're trying to figure out who needs us more. And um, ultimately, over the next few hours, I started to, to lose the vision in, in this left side, so it started just creeping in on me. And um, so they, they took me in for kind of an emergency procedure they call a craniotomy, it had turned out that as, that as those pliers came in, it had kind of busted parts of my skull and pushed them into my brain. Uh, and so I was starting to lose vision, and it was extremely painful. <laughs> and uh, so they, they rushed me into this surgery and uh, kind of fix, fixed me up a little bit. Um, if you're, I apologize if you, I, I don't think, I think everybody can do with this. It's kind of gross. But um, this is where they kind of laid the side of my head open to get in there and do what they needed to do make the repairs, staple it. Those are staples. And uh, I also got a new haircut. They didn't charge me anything for that haircut. Um, and so th this is what it kind of looked like in the aftermath. And, and I really, I only, this is a colorful story. It's kind of a wild story, but I only, it's, it's a part of my testimony because it's an example. It was the first example in my life, really, where I was delivered up out of some some uh, dangerous situation, right? So um, multiple of my doctors told me, listen, that it's a very realistic outcome that you're dead, that you're disabled. You know, it's, it's kind of a miracle, right, that, that this happened to you um, and, and that I'm standing here before you like I am. I had some nerve damage where actually for a long time I couldn't move the, the left side of my forehead, and which makes for a cool party trick. You know, you can still do that. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, fortunately, another kind of mini miracle uh, uh, on top of this one is that there's a phenomenal surgeon here in town. He's actually a plastics guy. Um, his name is Tom McClellan. He, he went in and uh, committed himself out, I mean, for hours on a second surgery. He went fishing through the side of my head there to try to figure out where that nerve damage was, discovered a really thick black uh, suture that was applied during the, during the emergency procedure that was pinching off a nerve, and he removed it, and now I you know, praise the Lord, I can use my face again, right? So, because um, as a 20 something year old kid, they told me if we don't fix that, it's going to, it's going to atrophy and sag and it's just not going to be a good, I wouldn't be this stunningly handsome man that stands before you today. So what, the reason that this is important to our story is because, you know, the, 
this was a case where um, I don't know that I was in a position to really be praying for myself, but certainly my brand new wife was praying for me fervently. Um, our family, just, just a whole group of people that were lifting me up in prayer and asking for a miracle here because it was not clear at the beginning what was going to happen. And um, I think it was the first example of God really stepping into my situation. Um, I had lived a really kind of a sheltered uh, life up to this point, and it, we were able to see just firsthand the, the power of God and what he can do for us um, when, when, we, when we need him. Uh, and so it was the first like I said, just, just really hitting home, driving that home to your heart. You know, you hear a lot of these things and you learn academically about who the Lord is and what he can do and what he has done. But when you experience that firsthand, it's powerful. It's powerful. So the next thing I want to tell you about is um, if we fast forward to uh, 2015. So now my wife and I have been married for about three years. We, we kind of did the, the newlywed thing and we're ready to start a family. And so um, we went ahead and, and kind of took those steps, got pregnant, and uh, our, our first baby, who was a boy, uh, was due in, on July, in July of 2015. And so we had never done this before, brand new parents, first, first time baby. And um, I can tell you that honestly, I was, I was anxious about how to be a father and how, how to uh, take care of a baby and everything. But I never once gave any consideration to the delivery process and, and the risks associated with delivering a baby. Um, it turns out that it, it's... It's not all just a walk in the park, and there are a lot of things that can go wrong, but that had never even crossed my mind. Uh, my wife was young and fit and strong and healthy, and you know, we just never even considered that something might go wrong in that process. But ultimately, that's, that's what happened. Um, in the early morning hours of July 6th, we went in. My wife began labor. We went into the hospital here at, at Mon General, and she's laboring for a long time. I mean, it was like you know, almost 24 hours that she's, she's laboring with this baby. And uh, she, she gets to the place where the, the baby is, is crowned, crowning, right? So you can see the top of his head, but he's stuck. I mean, stuck. And um, to stand there as a, as a husband and as a father and to watch all this happen, I mean, I'm just a, a mess because Sarah was just spent. I mean, she was just, there was nothing left in the, in the tank. And so um, we had a really good relationship with our, with our OB, and he understood that, you know, we wanted to avoid a, a cesarean if we at all can. I think any of you who've had any experience with the C-sections, you know that that's a, that's a major thing. And uh, the other thing about it is it kind of commits you as a, as a mother, it commits you to that unless you're going to try to go kind of V-back, it commits you to C-sections going forward. And this is our first baby. So he knew we had a really good relationship with him. Um, awesome guy. And he knew we were trying to avoid that however we could. And so he decided to attempt to use what's called a vacuum to deliver this child. And it, if you don't, if you're not familiar with that, it's a suction cup. And, uh, you know, in my mind, when he's explaining it to me, I'm picturing this like very gentle kind of, you know, extractive process. Um, and that's not really what how it works, uh, you know, they, what happened was they attached this, this suction cup to the part of the head that, that we could see, um, and then just start pulling on it, and uh, it was kind of jarring for me <laughs> to see that, because I'm thinking, like, this, this is pretty fragile, I think, this kid, and, and there, there's a lot of force being applied, and, um, and we, we attempted the vacuum, you know, several times, three, four times, um, and ultimately, he, he was stuck. He wasn't coming out, and so they made the call after trying all that and, and some other interventions too, and Sarah just was through the ringer, and they tried uh, everything they could, and they were like, okay, it's, you know, it's time for a C-section. So ultimately, after all that, she essentially delivered this baby both ways, which was just I still to this day am in, in, in awe of my wife and how she suffered through that. Um, but so we, we have the C-section, the baby comes out, everybody's okay, Sarah's not okay. <laughs> she's, she's recovering and she's hurting a lot, but we have a baby, right? And so... We're thinking, you know, that was pretty touch and go, but we're, we're moving past it. Here's the baby. And so I can still remember that, that first morning waking up, and there's a baby crying. I'm in the hospital. I've been awake all night, and I'm thinking, oh, man, like, here, here it is. <laughs> I'm looking around like, oh, this is my baby now. So um, I, I remember that feeling and just the weight of the responsibility. But, it, you know, we, we, were, we were adjusting to it. And within the first day or so, um, my wife's mo mother came in to see us, and she's, she's holding the baby, and she started asking us, like, hey, what's this thing he's doing with his legs? Is that, that's not, doesn't seem typical. We're like, I don't, I don't know. I mean, we, <laughs> we don't know anything about this baby. Um, we've, first time we've ever done this, right? And so um, she kind of raised it as a concern, but then let it, let it be, 
Um, and what was happening was we were seeing this kind of rhythmic, uh, repetitive kicking motion coming from, from his legs. And, um, you know, praise, praise the Lord that the next, that either that morning or the next morning, it's been, it's been a while, I can't remember the time frame, but one of the pediatricians comes in to make their rounds. And pr praise God, just as she's coming in, you know, her countenance is bright, and they're like, hey, you know, congratulations, I'm just here to check on the baby. And then within moments, this kicking starts. And it was like, yeah, everything changed. Um, you know, her just, her whole demeanor switched from pleasantries and hey, good morning to what is this? When did this start? How long has this been happening? You know, just, just clearly very concerned about it. And she goes on to explain to us that these look to be seizures, uh, and we need to take this baby to Ruby like right now. And so, you know, again, we've just been through that whole process of the delivery, and now Sarah's in no position to move. Um, she's going to stay there in Mon. They load our son into this box that looked like it was going to the International Space Station, and they're going to put him in, a, in an ambulance, and we're going to take him across the street. And fortunately for us, Mon and Ruby, I mean, you could almost, you know, walk between the two. So I'm jumping in my vehicle and going over there. I got my wife in this hospital, my son in this hospital, and they take him to the NICU and check him in. Uh, did a bunch of imaging, you know, CT uh, imaging of his brain, um, and they explained to us that, that, I remember, I still remember the neurologist, we're sitting there with Caleb, he's all hooked up, and the neurologist wheels this big monitor in, and it starts flipping through pictures, and they're just cross sections of his brain kind of moving, moving down, and first there's this little, little bright spot, and then the next picture it's a little bigger and a little bigger and a little bigger, and then she gets to the place where there's this huge area of um, the back right part of his brain that's just all lit up. And she's explaining to me that this is a, this is a bleed, this is a, a, you know, a brain bleed that uh, coincides right there with where the, the vacuum was applied. And based on what we know about this part of the brain, you know, it's, it's really hard to say as a baby, but it's possible that he may have some pretty significant spasticity um, in, the, in the left side of his body. It's a part of the brain that's controlling your, you know, your motor functions. And she kind of explained that, you know, this, this left side of his body may be kind of spastic like this. And in most extreme cases, you, you, can't, you can't use it. Um, but it's hard to say. We don't know. We don't know. And uh, that, was, that was really hard because I remember at the time when, when we were doing the vacuum thing, I had my doubts about, you know, is this okay? And, and I, I kind of spoke up at one point and was assured. And I'm thinking, I should have done more, right? Like I should have asserted myself and, and stepped in and stopped that because now what's going to happen? What's going to happen to my son? And uh, so again, you know, it was, this, it was this experience. It was this really the second time in my life where you just, you, you're, you're pouring yourself out to the Lord. You're asking for, for help. Um, you realize just, just how totally helpless you are. You know, it's just there's nothing you can do. Um, these folks that you're relying on, and, I mean, they're, they're qualified professionals, and certainly they, they have their role, uh, and they're an important part of the process. But really, at the end of the day, there's not a lot they can do either, guys. And so it's, you're, you're, uh, you're bringing your case to the Lord. And um, I just remember in that season, again, just the overwhelming response of um, just, just prayerful support from our church family, from our family family, from our friends and family, right? Um, just praying for Caleb, lifting him up. And uh, he was in there for a short time, and he was on, they got, they got things under control with uh, anti-epileptic drugs, which was a huge, that's the first big step is get those seizures under control. He's in the NICU for a little while, and then they sent us home. Um, and they, uh, here's, this is a picture of, you know, me right after, Caleb was delivered, Sarah was off, you know, recovering, and then here's Sarah the first time, this is the first time she ever got to see Caleb, but eventually she was able to come out of the hospital at Mon and come over to Ruby, and so um, this is our son, and, and we were just praying, and we didn't, we didn't know, right, because you're in this kind of wait and see mode of let's see what happens to this kid. Um, they sent us home, and he was on some seizure drugs for a while, and, uh, you know, just the second huge, just beautiful answer to prayer in our lives is that, you know, this is my son now. Um, he, when he goes mini golfing, he, he's more about the rock climbing than the mini golfing. But um, this is him. Both of these pictures are kind of old, but uh, he, he plays pickleball. He runs and jumps and climbs. Here he is uh, climbing. Um, and it, you've probably seen him running around here. I, I know those of you who are, work with the school, you, it's pretty clear that he has full function of both sides of his body. Uh, sometimes you want to maybe tie his hands behind his back to keep him under control. But, uh, you know, praise the Lord that this is our son now. I mean, he's, he's, uh, 
he's unaffected. He's he's just he's moved on. He's just like I just like I was, right? So all these terrible things that could have been, and there's this overwhelming prayerful response from from God's people, and uh, and and he came through for us in a big way, and so. Um, yeah, so these are the two, I mean, these are the two big experiences that I had as a, as a young person that really what they did, in, in hindsight, I think what the Lord was doing with this was, was um, he was demonstrating to us his, his sufficiency, his, his ability, his power to, to work in our lives, and there was no disputing what God can do. It's like if you forget, um, I can just, I got a scar here to prove it. If you, the next time you see my son, um, ask him, he'll tell you the story. He knows the story. And he's got, a, he's got a flat spot right there on his head that if you're ever, you know, if he needs a reminder, he's got a spot right there for it. And um, I just, I just thank, thank God for that. Um, so all this kind of sets us up for uh, the, when we decided to have our second child, which would have been um, to like 2017. And so Sarah and I used to joke about the second time around is like, oh, man, remember all that crazy stuff from the first one? This, will, this one will be smooth sailing, right? This will be the, uh, we'll, we'll, kind of, we'll finally get the, the pregnancy and birth experience that we're looking for uh, with this one. And ultimately, that kind of is what happened. Um, we, uh, we had Addison on uh, September 4th of 2017, which as an interesting aside, is exactly five years to the day from when that stabbing occurred on on the road there in Grantsville. So exactly five years later, we have this, um, our second baby. This is a little girl. Um, her name is Addison. And the, the pregnancy process, the delivery, everything was pretty smooth. Um, and so in a lot of ways, we thought, okay, yeah, you know, now we're, we're on track. Um, but it didn't quite develop the way we expected it to. Um, I remember that you know, there are some things now that in, in hindsight, with the benefit of hindsight, you can look back and kind of see things that you didn't see the first time, right? And um, there, were some, there were some things about Addison that kind of were red flags. I think a lot of the medical providers around her kind of saw them, but they weren't really sure how, what to make of it or how to talk to us about it. But she was very, she had a really low birth weight, um, not a good, uh, what is it, the APGAR score, right? Um, there were just some things uh, that that probably kind of cued us in that maybe there's something to be concerned about here. But the first big thing that happened was with Addie, it was about a month or so after she was born. Uh, and I remember Sarah calling me at work and she's like, you're not going to believe this, but I, I think that Addison is actually having seizures now. And, and I'm like, come on, certainly not. I mean, certainly not. Um, there was no vacuum for Addison. I mean, how, why, would, why would she be having seizures? And so kind of like we did that part already. We checked that box. We're never going back there. I'm kind of in denial about it. And so I come home from, from work. It takes me about 45 minutes to come home. And in the time that it took me to kind of get home and for us to get prepared, um, the, the, uh, the severity and the frequency of these episodes were picking up to the place where, I mean, it was just indisputable, undeniable. She's having seizures. And so uh, we take her into the emergency room. Uh, and they kind of hook her up. Uh, this is an EEG machine, if you don't know. I could probably hook one of these up. I've done so many of these. Um, so they, they kind of hook her up to the, this machine and start checking things out. Yes, these are seizures. We're going to try to get to the bottom of why, what's going on. Uh, and there's really no good explanation. And so in hindsight, again, you know, it's the benefit of hindsight, right? Um, in hindsight, I think that the, the providers there, uh, certainly not to speak ill of anyone, but I think they were just buffaloed. I don't think they had any idea what was going on with this kid. There wasn't any reason why, apparent reason why she should be having seizures. Um, they, they took a spinal tap, and it was a little bit high in protein, which uh, we were told can be a marker of spinal meningitis. And so I think for lack of any better explanation, it was like, we're going to call this thing spinal meningitis. Here, take this medicine uh, and go home. And so the problem is that's what we wanted to hear, right? We wanted to hear that it's some temporary infection, no big deal. Um, she took some medicine for a little bit and came off of it, and we moved on. So um, certainly another scare, but we're thinking, you know, praise God, we're, we're, we're moving on from this. We're, we're, we're going to put all this in the rear view. Uh, but then what happened um, a little bit about, let's see, about six months or so later, seven months later, um, we, took a, we took a family trip to, uh, to Florida, and Addison just really lethargic and kind of sleeping a lot. My wife still says, you know, that was the big thing for her. She's like, man, she just sleeps a lot, sleeps a lot. 
And uh, as we get home from this family trip, we had a whole new thing happen. And so uh, I remember once again, Sarah's mom, if you haven't picked up on this, Sarah's mom is very instrumental in figuring out what's going on with our kids. Grandmas are, are good for that. Um, they're at the park, I think, and, and Addison starts doing this weird thing with basically out of, out of nowhere, her head would kind of drop and her hands would go up. Uh, and then she would recover to, to kind of normal, and then a couple a second later, head would drop, and just over and over with this, over and over. And um, really odd, but it was unlike any seizure thing that we'd ever seen. I mean, I think of seizures as like very, um, you know, a, a lot of movement, a lot of repetitive jerking mo movement, and certainly that, that can be characteristic of seizures. But uh, we started sending the video around to some doctor friends that we had, and we're like, hey, what, what's up with, what do you make of this? And overwhelmingly, the response was like, you need to get to the hospital, like right now. And so um, we took her back in. Um, th in this picture, she's a little bit older, but hey, look, it's an EEG machine. <laughs> and um, so she, this is her in the hospital that second time. And uh, this time, we got a lot more information about what was going on. And we kind of concluded that what we saw earlier was really the kind of the initial signs of, of what we see here. Um, so they explained to us that these are seizures. They were able to do the imaging and the tests and get run all the tests. These are seizures. Not only are they seizures, they're a really specific type of seizure that is called an infantile spasm. Um, and these are really problematic because they, they almost always have an underlying condition. So there's, they, they, they rarely occur just in a vacuum, uh, like just general epilepsy or something like that. There's almost always an underlying component to it. Um, and so really then the conversation starts in earnest about, hey, what's, what's going on with Addie? Like, what, we've got these seizures, but what's, what's really going on, right? Like, what's the bigger story? And so they explained it to us that you can generally take kids with infantile spasms and divide them into two groups, those children that respond well to the initial treatment and those that do not. And if you're in that former group, your outcomes tend to be much, much better. The kids in that latter group that don't respond well to the, to the treatment tend to have very bad outcomes, um, you know, the, the worst type of outcomes. And so they explained to us that there's a few different treatment options, some of which are not even legal in the United States. I mean, we're like on the cutting edge of experimental medicine here. And really, it comes down to steroid treatment. And so they explained you can either kind of give them a lower dose steroid over a long period of time, or you can just really blitz it with ultra high dose prednisone um, and try to get the, the seizures to, to stop. So we're like, okay. Um, they explained that we're gonna take that second option. We're gonna hit it hard with the, with the steroid and uh, just see what happens. And that's, that's kind of where we were at. They're like, you know, you can, you can stay in here, but there's nothing we're gonna be able to do for you. you just, they kind of sent us home with the prescription for the steroid and said, go, you know, best of luck to you. And so um, I, I still remember one of the most powerful experiences that I had from this was I went home, uh, on the way home, I go to the pharmacy to pick up this prescription and uh, they, didn't, they didn't fill it. And they were like, and, and they were like, yeah, it's not, it hasn't been filled. And I'm like, okay, well, can you, I, can't, I need it. Like, can you fill it? Oh, hang on a minute, you know, and they go get the pharmacist and he kind of looks at some things and he comes back out to talk to me. He's like, hey, there's, there's gotta be a mistake here. Like you, how old is this kid? And I, I tell him, how much does she weigh? And I tell him, and he's like, you, you can't, you can't give that much of that drug to that kid. Like, I'm not filling that prescription. I'm like, well, okay, you know, call the neurologist back and see what, what they have to say about it. And I, he called and he comes back. He's like, yeah, that, there's, that's, what, that's what she's ordering. So he, he filled it for me. And that was the first moment where I was like, oh, okay, what are we, what are we getting into? This is clearly not um, familiar territory for the pharmacist. <laughs> and uh, so we started administering this, this drug. And uh, so I'm sure some of you are familiar with steroid treatment and prednisone and what it can do, but uh, I'm just going to share some pictures of you with, of Addison um, and kind of the effect that this had on her, on her body. So these are the first three. I got three more after this, but these are kind of time lapse left to right, you know. Um, and so she, what, what really happened was she got really hungry and really mean and angry um, and just cried. I mean, she was just, she was a miserable kid. And she's just packing on the weight. Uh, I don't, I don't have the like the dates in front of me for these pictures, but this is a relatively short period of time. I mean, this is a physical transformation that you would not ever expect to see under any circumstances. Um, here's the next three, uh, and so 
Yeah. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're doing this, and we're, and again, you know, we're kind of in this position again, right? I've been, I've been here a couple times now. We have a big need, um, and we're lifting this up to the Lord. And the scary thing was with the, with the steroid is, I, you know, I just keep replaying in my mind that there's two groups of kids. There's two groups of kids, you know, those that respond and those that don't. And um, for, for a while, for, for a good while, she was in the first group of kids that don't respond to the drug. It, it wasn't working. Um, she's packing on the weight. She's, she's still having the episodes, mul- multiple episodes a day. And we're like, you know, what is this, what is this going to mean? And um, I remember Sarah and I talked about, I mean, we were praying for her constantly. And I remember we talked about, hey, let's, let's um, write down some of, the, some of the Bible verses that really mean a lot to us, those verses that we're really hanging our hope and our faith on. And let's just put them up in her room um, or around her crib where she sleeps. And uh, we talked about it, and we were going to do it, and, and then we didn't, and we were going to do it, and we did. And then and finally, um, one night, you know, we're in a pretty desperate place, and we, we took that step, and we did that. And I, 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 I swear to you that, that that night, she went to bed, and she woke up, and we never saw another seizure. Um, and so at that moment, I'm very hopeful. I'm like, man. Like, I don't, I don't know if there's a quota on, uh, on miracles or what, but, like, I, it, it looks and feels like we're going to get another one. Um, we, were, we were really encouraged. But the question really remained that, but what's the underlying? Like, okay, you stop the seizures, but what's, what's really going on with, with Addison? And so um, that's when the search really began uh, in, in earnest. Um, and, and during this season, you know, there was just so much uncertainty about what, what is her future going to look like? Is she going to have a future? I mean, what, you know, there, there was all these different possibilities and the uncertainty was just really heavy. And I remember one night I was, I was praying, I mean, just praying my guts out. And I think you guys have probably all been there where you're just desperately pleading. And um, it was the middle of the night, I'm on my couch. And I, I remember feeling like the message I got from, from the Lord to my heart was, yeah, but, you know, so, sometimes the answer is no. You know, like, what, what, if, what if the answer here is, is no? And, and I feel like it was kind of given back to me, like, now you decide what to do with that, you know. Um, and and I, was, I was obviously emotionally wrecked about it, but I, I felt like it was, it was clear there to my heart that, you know, I, I, I have to decide what I'm going to do with this. Um, if, what if he says no? What if she doesn't have the outcome that I'm looking for? I'd never, I'd never dealt with that, right? Up to this point in my life, all these difficult situations, my will and God's will evidently lined up really well, and so I didn't need a whole, whole lot of faith for that, and I didn't need a whole, whole lot of trust for that. Um, and now for the first time, it was kind of submitted back to me like, okay, but sometimes it doesn't go the way you want. And, um, and, and it, was, it was given to me like, do you, do you trust me with that or not? And I, I kind of had to make the decision that night, like, okay, you know, what is this going to look like? I, whatever it is, I, I'm, I'm on board. Um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose to trust the Lord with this, uh, even if it doesn't go the way that we want it to go. And so um, I remember that was a pivotal moment in, in kind of my faith journey um, and my spiritual development. It was like before we even had the answer, I was preparing myself for the, for the answer I didn't want to hear. Right, and um, ultimately, what happened? We took Addie all over the place uh, to these genetic specialists and all these tests and those tests. WVU, UPMC, Cincinnati Children's. Ultimately, we ended up out in Cincinnati, which is an exceptional children's hospital. And uh, we didn't know it at the time, but those folks we had one office visit, and those folks knew exactly what it was. It's amazing to me that I mean, um, it's just such. It's so important to just find the right specialist find the right doctor for your for your situation because it was I mean it was just a mystery to everybody else but we we go to this one office visit and um, they didn't tell us much that day but uh, they ordered a test they ordered a specific test um, and then it, it, when we got the the visit notes back they had noted hey we suspect it's this condition and we ordered this test they, they knew what it was um, but they didn't really talk to us about that at the time so they ordered this test we went and got this this genetic test uh, and then one day, and I think it was in October, um, they called my wife, and I guess, you know, this is sometimes how news like this gets delivered. They called her on the phone and said, hey, test results are back. Um, your daughter has a genetic disorder 
called uh, 1P36 micro deletion disorder. Um, basically, there's a section of DNA missing from this certain position on her first chromosome and you know all this stuff, and, and they started to tell um, Sarah what that means. And the scary thing was it, you just get, you don't know a lot at that stage. Um, the, the range of prognoses, I think this is the case for a, a lot of um, genetic conditions. You know, the range of possibilities is super, super wide. Um, but, you know, on the one extreme end, the most unfavorable end of the spectrum, you've got kids that are totally disabled, um, you know, can't, can't feed themselves, can't toilet themselves, can't move, get up and move around. Um, virtually all of these kids are, are nonverbal, we're told. Um, and so it just, it looked, now, but then we, Sarah sought out a, a Facebook group for, of 1P36 parents, and we, then we started to see some things like, uh, some of these kids go to school outside of a special ed context. Um, she, she discovered this one girl that actually went to like a trade school, a vocational school, kind of post-secondary school. So we're like, okay, you know, where on this, on this spectrum are we going to, are we going to land? Um, and ultimately that was really, that was really hard to hear, right, because what we were hoping for, against all hope, uh, was that we were going to just get a clean bill of health and we were just going to move on. Um, but I feel like God was preparing me that night before we even got this news that that may not happen. And uh, I had, I think up to this point, I had a little bit of a distorted view of the Lord. Like, you know, from my experience, I can kind of just do my own thing, live my own life, um, don't have to pay much attention to him. And then when I get in a really tight jam, I can reach out and kind of like a bellhop, right? I can ring him up and say, hey, this is what I need. I can just tell him what I need, and he'll come in and deliver a miracle. <laughs> that, that had been sort of the experience up to this point. And I think he was preparing me through that season that, that, that like, that's not always how it's going to work. And, and so ultimately, in Addie's case, um, you know, it, that we got that hard news, and we were working through, kind of processing through what to do with that. Um, but I will say that if we fast forward um, now, Addison's um, four, four, uh, and so she's going to be turning uh, five. But this is a picture of her. These are both kind of old. Um, that we did, we did get get the seizures under control. She was on some seizure drugs for a long time. Uh, and ultimately, we were able to wean her off that after she was like three years, no seizures. We, we were able to wean her off of the seizure. So she doesn't take any drugs now. Um, this, is a, this is a picture of her. You can see the weight kind of coming back off and the, the smiles coming back. Uh, and then now these are a, a few more recent pictures of Addison. And she's just beautiful. I mean, she's, she's amazing. And um, I can tell you that, uh, you know, it's it's been a miracle what the Lord has done in her life. I mean, it's every milestone has been hard fought. Um, you know, it's we see with our other kids, we see them achieving these developmental goals, and it just kind of happens. It's like you plant a seed and a plant just grows. You know, um, with Addison, it's like every inch is fought for. Um, it was it was a fight to get her to to roll over. It was a fight to get her to stand up. It was a fight to get her to walk in. It was. You know, the, she, she does talk. She's not entirely nonverbal, which puts her in a, certainly down the more favorable end of the spectrum for kids with her condition. Um, she's hard to understand, but she'll, she'll talk. She has some words. Um, and, it, you know, we just give praise to God every day for, for what he has done in Addie's life. But look, I, I feel like I would be, it would be disingenuous of me to sit here and pretend like it's all just rosy. Um, it's, it's still, it's hard. Every day is hard. Um, and, you know, I would, I would submit to you that that's okay. It's okay to admit that. Um, I think one of the challenges that I had working through everything with Addison was, you know, there, there's oftentimes this sentiment of, from, from folks outside looking in about just, you know, what, a, what, a, what an amazing thing God has done. And it's like it's all just uh, roses and sunshine. And it is true. I mean, the Lord has done incredible things in our lives. I just told you about all the incredible things he's done, and Addison is no exception. But I also think that it's okay, guys, to just accept that sometimes what you've been dealt isn't what you would have chosen for yourself. And I think that it's okay to own that. It's okay to grieve over that um, and, and then trust the Lord in spite of that. Uh, I think that uh, for in the early periods there, sometimes I was challenged, like, you know, you got to have more faith that God can step in and do an, an, an amazing healing work in her life. You got to have more faith for that. You got to hope for that. And, and what I often would say in response is, I, you know, from where I sit, um, it feels to me like it takes more faith to accept the possibility that that isn't going to happen. And um, so, 
You know, Addie is a, is a blessing in our lives. She, she touches people's hearts. I mean, it, everybody who meets her is just impacted by her and her story. Um, she's the sweetest kid, and she's so innocent. And um, we just, we praise God for her. And, and everything that he has taught us through her life and um, just the work that the, that the Lord is doing in hearts and minds through that little girl is, is encouraging, inspiring. Um, so, you know, the, this, the last time I shared my testimony, this was the end of the, the story, but we've since added a, a chapter or two at the end, um, and it has helped me to appreciate even more just how God can redeem situations. Um, we, we were originally, I, I told everybody we were going to be one, one, and done, you know, one boy, one girl, and then done. Um, and that was our plan. But it was kind of laid on our hearts, Sarah and I, that, you know, our family's not going to look the same um, as we thought it would. And certainly for our older son, for Caleb, um, he's not going to have the same type of companionship. Certainly he, he plays with Addison and they get along great. But as they grow older, the space between them gets wider and wider. Um, and so we wanted to s- s- consider, we wanted to prayerfully consider the possibility of trying for another baby. And, um, but of course with that, I mean, Addison's condition is a genetic condition, right? Now we were told that almost all 1P36 disorders are de novo. I've learned a lot about genetics, by the way, are uh, de novo, meaning that they are not inherited. Um, They're just you know, it's a genetic mutation that occurs during fetal development, and, that, and that we were kind of told probably it's not something that she inherited from you guys. But the other thing I've learned about genetics is there's, we're right there on the cutting edge of medicine. There's a lot. I mean, it's more scientists than it is doctors, really. Um, still figuring a lot of this out, the human genome and how to interpret it. It's just it, we're, we're way out there on the bleeding edge. And so I wasn't altogether comfortable <laughs> with the possibility of taking another crack at this. What if they're wrong? What if... What if, you know, the same thing happens again, and the guilt that I would have for that, um, what that would mean for our family, and we prayed about this a lot, and, and I felt like what I, what I received was, I know a lot of people in my family, in, in my family, my friends, my close circle that have really struggled with conception, and um, it's common. I mean, people try and try and try for a baby, and they don't, they don't get one, and what I kind of, what I felt like the Lord was telling to, to my heart was, do you think I'm in control of this or not? Um... Do you, do you, are you willing to trust me with it or not? You know, that he's going to do what's, what's best for us, that he is for us. Um, and so I just decided, we decided to, to trust the Lord with that, um, to step out in faith and, and to, to do this. We did do some, another, some additional genetic testing to just kind of verify as best they can tell, you know, that this condition was not inherited. Um, I felt like we had a responsibility to our kids to do that. Um, and once we kind of stepped through that, we, we started trying again. And this is uh, number three. So this is, this is Graham Harrison Nagy. Um, he was born on March 16th of last year. Um, he's Graham 316. Um, and man, this kid has been just an, an amazing blessing for us. Um, you know, it's... It, up to this point, we had, we had been able to see with our own eyes and hear from people um, and certainly know in our hearts um, what God was doing in and through Addison's story. But then here's a whole life. I mean, he's right there. He's yelling at you. Um, here's a whole life that would not have existed if, if it were up to me, right? And so I think Graham is the most direct and tangible example of the way that the Lord can redeem situations, um, take, oh, sorry, thank you, take, take a situation that you would never have chosen for yourself, and to, to turn it around, take what was, what appeared to be um, just devastating on, on the surface, and turn it around and repurpose it for good, and I think um, that's some of what we've learned, I mean, we've, we've learned so much through this process, and the last time that I shared my testimony, I had a little kind of little preachy bit at the end. I was afraid I wouldn't have time for it this morning. Um, but I can tell you that for me personally, the one thing I'll share with you is I wrestled a lot with, with God's sovereignty in this and um, just like, are, are you in control or not? Because I'll, I'll tell you, when you speak with um, geneticists, especially a lot of them with you know, secular backgrounds, and they're explaining to you about genetic mutations, you get this overwhelming feeling. It's like, hey, man, it was bad luck. 
It's not something that she got from you. It's not something that you could control. It's just, hey, sorry. It's random. Bad luck. And um, I struggled with that a lot. I'm like, is it? I mean, is it just unlucky? Is God in control of this situation? Um, Because the minute that you uh, buy into the total sovereignty of God, we got a lot of hard things to deal with, right? Like if he's in control of everything that happens, there's some hard questions that we have to answer. Um, and I don't have all those answers, but what I can tell you is that um, I, had, I had sought out um, some teaching. I was aware of uh, the passage in Romans, Romans 8, 28, very famous verse. I think everybody's probably heard it before, um, that we know in all things God works for the good of those uh, who love him and have been called according to his purpose. And that that verse seemed to speak very directly to my situation because, I mean, it, that's a big check to write. If you buy that for what it says, that's a big, big check to write in all things. It doesn't say most things. It doesn't say, you know, five out of ten times. You know, it says in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and called according to his purpose. So I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm going, uh, this thing too? Does that apply to this thing? And um, I sought out some teaching on this from a pastor that I have come to just appreciate so much. Um, his name is Doug McLean. He's a, he's a pastor at Calvary Chapel of Delta, Pennsylvania, and I just listen to his stuff all the time, especially in this season I did. And what he, he just preaches verse by verse through the Word. So I just went to Romans 8. What does Doug have to say about this? And I was sitting around. I was almost not even paying attention because I'm waiting for him to get to verse 28. And then all of a sudden, the, the, the Lord just captured my attention with the verses leading up to 28. Uh, and it's Paul talking about just our present state and, and just the brokenness and the, and the fallenness of creation. And, and he says, um, For creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself would be liberated from its bondage. And this kind of set me on this path. I mean, I was... that. There were some times in this season that I was, I was indignant. I mean, I was indignant like somebody owes me an answer. And I was digging through this thing feverishly, looking for what does the Lord have to say for himself. And um, this kind of set me on this, on this path to, to really just buy the idea that God is sovereign in our situation, in all things, and that the, the brokenness and the fallenness and the... And the the bondage to decay that we see in creation right now is God's deliberate response to our sin. And not, he's not punishing us. He's, he's using this brokenness that we see around us in, in all kinds of ways, guys. I mean, he, he can repurpose like he did with my son, with Addison's condition, like he did in the book of Genesis with Joseph's story. I mean, he took a situation that was intended for evil and he redeemed it for good. Um, he, can, he can use it to teach us to, to long for heaven. I mean, I never, I was pretty comfortable. And by, by most standards, I still am pretty comfortable. But I was very comfortable. Um, upper middle class, living in the United States. I have, like, I, my life is as cushy as it gets. And it's hard to bring your heart to a place where you're longing for heaven when you're comfortable here, right? And so I think part of the blessing can be that the Lord can teach us that you just, you just feel it in your bones that the things are not right, that this is not what we were made for, and, and it gives you that eternal perspective on things. And I also think that it teaches us to rely on him in ways that we never would. I mean, I told you, I, I consider myself a pretty capable person, and through this season, I, I was at the end of myself. I mean, uh, if, if I don't ever run into anything that I can't personally solve, then how hard is it to make, make sure that I'm not sitting on the throne of my own life, right? Um, that I'm not God in my own life. I have to run into something really hard to, to learn that lesson. And I think that those are just some of the things that God has done with this situation in our life. But I would challenge you this morning to buy into Romans 8.28, to believe it with your heart. Um, and I can tell you that a lot of times you need help to believe it. And um, my, my hope and my prayer is that uh, each one of us would come into a situation in our lives where we, uh, God is, is, is merciful and gracious to teach us that lesson. And um, I, I just would close with this. I know my wife, this has been her kind of banner verse. Um, Emily Pumphrey, who watches our kids, she's amazing. We are, we are the most sad. We're probably more sad than her parents that she's in, in Hungary this summer. Um, but she recently did a beautiful uh, painting with this verse for Addison's room from uh, John chapter 16. And 
uh, this, this really encapsulates our, our life and our experience, I think, up to this point. You know, it, look, you're going to have, you're gonna have uh, trouble. I tell you these things that you may have peace. Um, it's without this, without the promises that we have in God's word, it's hard to have peace through these, these, through these seasons. Um, but you will have trouble. Not, you might, not if you're unlucky, not if, you know, the genetic lottery deals you a bad hand. You will, you will have trouble. But take heart, because I have overcome the world, says our Lord Jesus Christ, right? So let's, let's close in prayer. <sighs> Father God, thank you for, for this opportunity. Thank you for uh, just, just the grace to uh, involve us in your story, to uh, choose us, to choose us to be participants in what you're doing in your great plan for the redemption of humanity, Lord. Thank you for everything that you do in our lives. Thank you for the lessons that you teach us, even the hard ones. Lord, I pray that you help us to uh, respond to what you're doing in our lives, not, not to fight it, but to just embrace, embrace it and to trust and to find that difficult balance between uh, grieving for our present condition and hoping for our future one. Lord, I, I just pray for each one here. I pray that for those of us who are uh, running up against the brokenness and the fallenness of creation right now, I pray for the peace that you promised us in John 16. I pray that you would uh, give that peace by the power of your Spirit to each one who needs it. And Lord, we, we trust you with this. We submit all this, and, and we, we submit to you as our Lord and Master this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.